I am a professor. I totally believe in academic freedom. And so, I, and I, yet I promote the academic boycott of Israel. Why? This is not double standards. Uh, we need to understand, A, that BDS is a means to an end, and B, that uh, the academy, as, as it now functions, there is no academic freedom. The Israeli academy is extremely complicit in the occupation, in op oppression. But also, I mean, uh, what, what we need to understand is that the academy, most people think that the academy is like this free exchange of ideas that is somehow non-political. We need to understand how even here, the academy is very, very political, very politicized. If we look at uh, politicians, the governments, mostly they consult experts, and those experts are professors. I mean, we frequently are asked to, you know, we just go, are asked uh, to provide analysis about developments, and we're interviewed, and we speak, but we do a whole lot more than that. Most, uh, many of us, uh, oh, not many of us, but most politicians, most presidents, most decision, political decision makers consult with scholars, and based on that expertise of the scholars, make political decisions. That's how intimate the relationship between the academy and politics is. And this is something that is not recognized when we speak about the academy as a free exchange of ideas. If President Obama wants to make a decision, he goes to professors of the Middle East, okay? Um, and generally, there is no controversy around that. I mean, you know, but with, with the hard sciences, we expect that research is going to lead something to something. But with, with politics, we don't necessarily make that connection. But the connection needs to be made because it is there. And, uh, and because the universities are very, very intimately uh, related, connected to the occupation. I want to speak specifically about Israel. There are within is and, and you know to show to document just how much within israel there are seven main universities israel is a relatively small country so seven main research universities is quite big i'm not counting the smaller universities i'm not counting the non research universities and i'm not counting the what would be the equivalent of community colleges there are seven main universities in israel and every one of them is directly complicit in the occupation the Israel Institute of Technology, for example, better known as the Technion, uh, which is most famous for applied sciences, develops research and development projects with the Israeli military, including the remote controlled D9 bulldozer used by the Israeli military to demolish Palestinian homes. Uh, most of us actually think the Caterpillar demolishes Palestinian home, and the Caterpillar bulldozer does demolish Palestinian home, but the Caterpillar bulldozer is actually equipped with a special blade, and that special blade that is equipped on those monstrous D9 bulldozers that Caterpillar builds, the blade itself that demolishes the, the, the homes is developed by the Technion. This is a university that develops the blade that demolishes Palestinian home. The Technion has also developed the equipment to detect underground tunnels, which, and that equipment is used by the Israeli military to enforce its, Giza, its siege on Gaza. Now, Gaza basically is, would not have survived without the tunnels. Basically, Gaza's siege is so, so, so strict, such a stranglehold on Gaza that Gaza does depend on the tunnels to, on the tunnels to bring in absolute basics for, it, for the survival of the people. And it's nothing but survival. And yes, they have dug underground tunnels. And the Technion has developed and offered the Israeli military the equipment to detect the Israeli tunnel, the, the underground tunnels. And then the Israeli military comes in and, and you know, bombards and shuts down the tunnels, meaning actually makes the siege even worse. Um, let me see. The Wiseman Institute, which is another very prestigious uh, research institution, has partnered with Elbit System to create uh, an electro-optic science uh, around, uh, around the wall. Elbit is the builder of the uh, separation wall. It's also the builder of the US-Mexico wall. The, the, so, so a university has partnered with it and actually sends its students to the Elbit labs 
instead of having a lab on campus, it's like, okay, go do your lab training with Elbit. And Elbit is this, is like a large, large Israeli defense company that has built the wall. Um, those are some ways I can go on. So for example, the engineering and architecture departments within Israeli universities are the ones that have designed uh, the, the, the apartheid wall as well as the settlements. You know, it's not like some real estate developer that decided, okay, I'm gonna build settlements. Those can happen, but, but it's primarily engineering and architecture departments in universities in Israel that have developed the, that have the blueprints and the drawings for settlements. Um, more, for example, Hebrew University and Ben-Gurion University competed for a grant to establish a school for military medicine, training staff to specifically serve in the Israeli military. And I think it's really important that you know, we don't necessarily distinguish between civilian medicine and military medicine in the US. I think we don't distinguish you know, the soldiers come back and they have PTSD and we try to treat them. And, uh, but, but in Israel, the distinction between civilian and military medicine is very important because Israel's military doctors have long been suspected of involvement in the torture of Palestinian prisoners. About 70% of all Palestinian prisoners are tortured in jail. Uh, Jail, torture is actually legal in Israeli jails. I mean, you know, there was a time when they said, you know, all countries torture in jail. I'm not saying that Israel is the only country that tortures in jail. I, I wish it were. It, no, all countries torture in jail. It's generally illegal. In Israel, there was a time when it was legal, then there was this big outcry of, you can't do a torture in jail, we are a civilized country and everything. So, so Israel decided to make torture in jails illegal, but there were so many loopholes because one of them was like, except in the case of a threat. All right, so as a result of the loopholes, an estimated 70% of prisoners, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails are tortured, and Israel's military medicine, the doctors who are military doctors, are suspected of being there in order to be complicit in the torture of Palestinian prisoners. That's what happens in Israeli universities. So when we call for an academic boycott, we are calling for, an acad for a boycott of those institutions that are complicit in the tools of oppression, the methods of oppression, the implementation of oppression, of dispossession, of, uh, of torture, of disenfranchisement, of home demolition. That's the academic boycott that we're calling for. It is not a boycott of individuals, it's a boycott of the institutions that are complicit. And it's important to know that, you know, to know the criteria and to know why we are boycotting. Because indeed we do believe in academic freedom, but I don't know that I would call that academic freedom when it's basically the privilege of the oppressor. That's what we're dealing with. When we say we need to, provide, to, pre, to protect Israel's academic freedom, what we are protecting is the privilege of the oppressor. Um, so the, the academy is not an ivory tower it is what I call the brain of the monster. It is where the ideology and the tools of occupation, dispossession, and violation of human rights are generated, and where the servants of occupation are rewarded while the victims are alienated. And by which I mean the people, soldiers who serve in the Israeli army um, get, of course, scholarships to some of these universities. And it's not just, you know, for, so obviously, Jews serve in the army and non-Jews don't serve in the army, so Jews have that privilege in the universities as, uh, in terms of scholarships. But then some universities specifically reward those soldiers who are known to have fought in like the ugliest battles, like Lebanon 2006, for example, the soldiers from that war get 80% scholarship. Gaza, the soldiers get 90% scholarship. You know, in the U.S., I think of it, it's like, you know, like those who killed in Iraq get 60% scholarship and those who killed in Afghanistan got 70%. Like, do you, like, I don't know how they calculate that, but they do. So that the soldiers of Gaza get 90% scholarship and the soldiers of Lebanon 2006 get 80% scholarship. That's the kind of, you know, rewarding the, uh, the criminals, basically. So how then do academics respond to that? We respond to that by saying, no, I'm not going to engage with you. I don't want to be part of this. I'm, I refuse to be 
joining forces and, and, and thinking that the Israeli Academy is a perfectly okay ivory tower of intellectual exchange and freedom of thought and all of that, because it is not. Um, so, uh, so some of the things that we can do as academics who want to be engaging in the, uh, in the academic boycott is, for example, we have to not as academics not accept uh, the semester abroad because the semester abroad sends students to basically a very sanitized Israel experience that does not introduce people to what's really going on. I mean, as uh, students who go clearly are not gonna see that because that's not what Israel is gonna project. So what, that's one way to engage in the academic boycott, for example, to refuse semester abroad proje uh, projects. Another way to engage in the academic boycott is uh, to not engage in joint research because most universities, you know, students who are paying uh, lots and lots and lots of money think that maybe they're funding the university. Most universities are not funded by student tuition. Most universities get their money from research projects. And joint research projects, usually as a professor, as a scholar, as a researcher, when you write up a grant for a research project, most projects are actually more likely to get funded if they're joint between two universities. And if you're, because of the power dynamic, the relationship dynamics, and now I'm speaking about the US, but I think it's very similar here in the Canada, if you are, writing up a grant for a research project between the US and Israel, you're practically guaranteed to get your grant. And as you get your grant, the money goes to both your university and the one in Israel. So the academic boycott would mean don't apply for a joint grant with an Israeli academy. This is the kind of boycott that we're calling for. It's a boycott that goes to the complicit institutions and it's a boycott of the institution, not of the individual. So, um, how am I doing on time? Oh, did I start? When did I start? Okay. Uh, all right, so the, Israel's academic and cultural accomplishments, because Israel is projecting its image as, a, as an academic, uh, a very accomplished academic center, as well as a very uh, polished, cultural center, and it's doing that in order to, and, and there's a major, major push on the part of Israel to project itself as this extremely uh, sophisticated academic and cultural country, and it's doing that in order to distract from the apartheid policies and its violations of international law. So Israel is actually using a facade that it is intentionally projecting as it seeks to fix its image that has been tarnished, because as, as the media has become a lot more democratic these days uh, with, you know, I mean, basically there used to be much, much, much greater control of media. Uh, there was much more effective censorship. And now with social media, with Facebook, with Twitter, with cell phones, with everything, there is documentation. And Israel's image has been tarnished. It has been so severely tarnished that Israel has created the Brand Israel campaign in order to fix its image. And one of the things that it's doing in order to fix its image is you know, showing its beautiful uh, academic face and showing its beautiful cultural face. But by doing... By doing that, it is distracting from its apartheid policies. The image has been tarnished by Israel's policies that are in violation of international law. But Israel is not fixing its policies, it is fixing its image. And it's fixing its image by show, showing, you know, like all of the birthright Israel come here and come spend a year in Israel and also with the cultural boycott. So Israel has decided as a result of the fact that its image has been tarnished through efforts such as Israeli Apartheid Week, Israel has decided that it's going to create this campaign called the Brand Israel Campaign. And the Brand Israel Campaign is, is an official propaganda campaign that is funded by Israel's three big, most powerful ministries, the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, and the finance ministry. And those three ministries have come together and decided we need to do something about Israel's image. We need to do something about Israel's image, and they are fixing the image, not the policies that tarnished the image. So what they did is 
they're sending uh, well-known, oh, I have that. Ari Mekel, who's the deputy, Israeli Deputy General for Cultural Affairs, decided that we're going to distract from all of this. We will send well-known novelists and writers overseas, theater companies, exhibits. This way you show Israel's prettier face so we are not thought of purely in the context of war. So clearly an intentional campaign to bring into the US, into the world, you know, to send what they call cultural ambassadors. Let us send people so we are not thought of primarily in the context of war. So one of the early converts to this idea of rebranding Israel was Hillel, the campus, the Jewish campus university. And the executive vice president of Hillel, Wayne Firestone, explained, he said, Israel, the campaign would portray Israel as a place where there are cool, hip, people. So again, when we speak about why we are doing an academic boycott, I've tried to explain why we're doing an academic boycott. Why are we doing a cultural boycott? Because Israel is sending cultural ambassadors in order to distract attention from its apartheid policies. And so, it's, and so we see all these people coming here in order to basically uh, show the pretty face of Israel. And, when we, and it's very, very challenging to engage in that cultural boycott because keep in mind that when Israel sends cultural ambassadors, of course it's not gonna send the nasty, ugly, violent Hebron settlers. I mean, that's what it wants to distract from. So it does send those artists who are indeed extremely nice tokens. For example, Idan Rachel, he comes to, um, Seattle at least twice a year. Very, very hip, cool person. You know, he's got long dreads, he sings reggae, he plays with the Ethiopian Jewish, uh, the young refugees, he sings about the beauty of tolerance and multiculturalism, holding hands and kumbaya. He's a very, very sweet guy. I've actually talked to him. I met him once outside the, we were picketing outside his, his uh, the concert hall where he was playing and he came out and he's like, why are you picketing? I said, I'm picketing because you're a cultural ambassador. He's like, but come in and listen to my music. I said, I don't listen to your music. I know that you're part of your propaganda tool. So it's what we need to keep in mind that we are not boycotting the art of the artist. We are boycotting the funding of that art. That's a very important distinction because the art of the artist, when Israel sends cultural ambassadors, is likely to be indeed the finest art that it has. But it is sending them as cultural ambassadors to distract from the apartheid policies. So we don't boycott the art of the artist, we boycott the, fu the funding of that art. If someone is here as a cultural ambassador, and they actually have, you know, they're designated cultural ambassadors. If someone is here as a cultural ambassador, sponsored by the Israeli ministry, sponsored by the Israeli consulate, sponsored by the Israeli uh, cultural affairs, then they are a cultural ambassador, and those are the ones we boycott. And again, I keep telling you that, you know, I keep telling people who organize these, it's challenging because we're boycotting the good stuff. But of course we're gonna boycott the good stuff. I mean, we, we're boycotting for a reason and it's political. We don't boycott because it's bad stuff. You know, the, the, I have a skincare, for example. We're, I hope that you're all familiar. Like, I don't boycott it because, you know, I've been using it for 10 days now and I still have wrinkles, so I'm gonna boycott it. No. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous to think of we boycott bad stuff. We boycott stuff that is propaganda, even if it's, you know. So, so keep in mind that Israel is sending all these cultural ambassadors and, uh, in order to fix its image, and it's sending those cultural ambassadors to a specifically targeted audience, an audience that actually wants to see the cool stuff. It, Israel's market is the liberal, progressive, people because the conservatives are already on their side. The fundamentalists are already on their side. What they are losing, which they had for the longest time, is the progressives. I mean, the, the, the beauty, the success of BDS is that indeed it has shifted the discourse. It used to be that within the progressive left, as it was known, the progressive left, um, the progressive left was very, very Zionist. 
And now, thanks to BDS, thanks to the education, thanks to everything we've been talking about, within that, that you know, it, it has shifted. So this is what Israel is targeting with its brand Israel campaign, not the fundamentalists. They're already on Israel's side. They're already more Zionist than the, than, uh, I mean, a lot, I mean, you know, like, the, the largest number of Zionists in the U.S. are not Jewish. They're the Christian Zionists. You know, we think Zionism is a Jewish movement. It's also Christian. They're already on that side. So who does Israel want to target then? The progressives. 